Thank you. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on to the public participation portion of the meeting. And Mr. Merker will begin with the superintendent's report. Really don't have much for a report tonight. The main purpose of our meeting, of course, is for everyone to get an op opportunity to see the plans for the uh, valley expansion project. It's been discussed often and, and quite a few times. We've come to a point tonight where we believe we have a, a good alternative, a good plan for the Board of Education to consider. Tonight is information only, and we'll be taking action at the February 21 meeting to officially proceed forward. That basically is our plan for the evening. I hope you all enjoy that. We, we do have a couple of other routine kind of board things that we're going to get into here shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. At this time, we will allow public participation. Is there anybody who wishes to address the board? If so, please raise your hand. Anybody sign in? Okay. Is there anybody here that would like to provide public testimony? Okay. We will then move on to the information discussion items. Information regarding the hall monitor position is available for the board's review. Are there any questions? I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, are there going to be metrics associated with, with this position as far as, you know, any, any type of metrics, I'm just going to ask you that question. How many, you know, incidents are in the hall, that type of thing? I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I would honestly say I haven't, we haven't considered that. I would just like to see, you know, the improvement that happens with these hall yeah. monitor positions as they're... I, I understand your question. My, our main focus with the hall monitor positions was to make sure that we could safely secure the front door mm -hmm. so the number of people that we can escort through, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, but that's our, that was one of our main focuses, is to make sure that our front door to the main office at the high school is a safe and secure area. Okay. And, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think it's really um, important to address any safety concerns in our buildings. Um, just as a point of background, um, I understand that um, this this concern was raised by Karen Dishroon, um, I think, with you, Randy. And yes. I was wondering, um, Karen, what what raised that concern? Was there a building administrator or? Uh, it had been presented to us by Dr. Parker previously. And then I just kind of observed on my own, you know, what she had mentioned. And so I just thought it should be something we address. Okay, and so when I read the job description, Randy, um, it sounded like it's a position, you know, a roaming position to monitor the halls and everything. Um, is, is, that, is that approach cover all of the safety concerns? Because I think the front door was the issue. And I guess my concern is hiring someone part-time to monitor the halls. If, if they're in the commons area or, you know, on the second floor and some dangerous person comes to the front door and is buzzed in, I'm not sure we've addressed no, I, that concern, I, you know? I understand your question. The, the main focus of this person would be at the front door. And while the job description may speak to them being out of their areas, I think the only time they leave that front door area is if there's some type of situation or incident somewhere where there, an extra set of hands is needed somewhere else. Routinely, they would not be wandering the building. Routinely, they'll be at the front door. Okay, thank you. Sure. Just to clarify, Cheryl, on October 18th, I just keep the um, weekly updates, and it was mentioned back then that in facilities that they were going to bring a recommendation um, to address the new district office, parking, and security terms at the Dunlap High School. So maybe I'm, I'm assuming that's where um, Karen came up with it, but I think the high school had concerns all along. And I guess I just don't recall um, you know, administrator to speaking us, to that, and so, like, you know, you're refreshing my memory, and I appreciate that. I saw a sketch somewhere of a drawing that I don't know which of the architects did, but it is a sketch of possible way to redo the front area of the high school, uh, but that still would require a person. It still would require some way to man that. And I think the, 
objective, I'm not sure, but maybe it's just to get some security in there before, um, until we can get something else established, is that my understanding, and just kind of play with it and see where it goes? I, in my opinion, I think it's a good short-term measure, may turn yeah. into a long-term measure, okay. but it's a good short-term measure. Yeah, let's, okay. let's make our environment as safe and secure as we can and move forward from there. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with um, trying to make sure that we have security for all of our students and at all of our buildings. So, um, you know, I, I'm not opposed to that at all. I do think um, with what Cheryl was saying, and I know we've discussed this before, to making sure that we have the right solutions in place. Um, you know, and this was discussed, as Beth said, back in October. And, and I believe it was kind of put on the back burner a little bit because uh, we had a lot of other things financially that we were trying to take care of. And to your point, Cheryl, I mean, it's just kind of resurfaced all of a sudden. And I think that's where some of the questions are coming from. And I know, um, you know, Mr. Merker, you, when you came in, you said you observed coming in as a new person to the high school that you saw that as one of the least secure places. Um, but yeah, this had been a conversation for some time. And this is something that we had, we, we had looked at and uh, the previous administrators were looking to secure that location. And I believe at that time it was thought that financially we weren't going to put the money into it right then. Uh, so I guess now coming in and having three bodies come in or three, and that's that what we're proposing, three people that will alternate? Probably three part-time people, yes. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, uh, you know. We just want to understand the timing on this because now we're putting the financial money towards it where there were other things that have been requested that were also put on hold that are also extremely important. So as we're bringing things back into the fold, you know, I just think it's important that we, um, we go back and make sure that we're looking at all those things that have been placed to the side. And I know some of those you may not be aware, aware of at the time. So I want to make sure that we are, you know, doing what's in the best interest of the students and also being fiscally responsible. Um, one concern I have is under qualifications, um, it just states that the person must be 21 years of age. Do we have, and I know it says that we're going to approve these positions uh, at the next meeting, February 21st? That's, that's our goal, yes. Okay, so have, um, I just, I guess I'm, I'm interested to know, did we have a diverse pool of applicants that have come in, uh, have we had the time to look into who these individuals will be that will be manning the doors of the high school? Uh, the high school was responsible for interviewing, and I believe that, that, I don't think we have any of our high school folks here tonight, but I believe they were going to do that last week, and I, I just have not had an update from them. Okay. So I, I really can't, an oops, pardon me, I really can't answer your question. Okay, okay, yeah, that would just be a concern, because obviously there's exposure to all the students, and we just want to make sure we're making good decisions and it, it, it was kind of quick the way it all moved. So just want to make sure that we uh, have a good process there. We get something in place and ultimately, obviously, we'll relook at this, you know, and just like it's been looked at that in, in the past and try to do what's best. That for our applicant pool isn't, isn't what we would hope it would be. You know, maybe we can come up with one person to start off with and continue the process and see who else we can add to the mix. So those are all options to consider. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Uh, I think oh, I'm just, you know, as, as I'm looking at the, um, the the description here, job description, and the objective is, is to provide safe and constant supervision of hallways and students during school hours. Do we want to put something in there as far as monitoring the entrance to the building? I don't see that here in any of the essential functions specifically to that because that's specifically what we're looking at is the safety as students and or visitors enter the building. We can we can certainly modify that. We frankly took that from a playground supervisor uh, John okay. description and okay. modified it to this. It wasn't something that just came from scratch so that we can easily modify that. Okay. I think that's a good idea. Sorry. Um, you'd want to make sure right that they're at the front door because if you read not this pulled out and sent to the hallway later because you know they can as I read this description, it, it's clearly for a hall monitor rather than someone right. at the entrance to monitor that. That's why I had that question about metrics for this this piece of it. Um, so I just want to make sure that we clarify in that job description. And the uh, order of operations, tonight's information item, we get all these questions out, make some modifications, yeah. we'll bring back that final document for approval at the 21st and hopefully also have people to approve to fill the position. Would, how about having um, the high school just take another look at this to make sure that sure. it is exactly what they intended it to be for? That'd be nice and then you can send it out to us before the meeting. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Okay. Information regarding purchase, the purchasing cooperative for perishable food, commodities, goods, and services is available in the packet for the board's review. Are there any questions? Can, can you just tell us what are the significant changes? I had to read this about four times myself to understand it. It's basically an Illinois State Board of Education directive. We're not going to really do anything different than we do now. It's just how the cooperative is going to be structured and it, it's something ISBE has required. Rather than us adding into the cooperative, they're going to rename and reorganize the cooperative. Nothing we do will be any different. It'll, it's simply a directive from ISBE that we had to make this change. So the superintendent that is in charge of the cooperative has done all the legwork for us and for other districts that are involved uh, to, to reorganize the structure. I, it, it sounds like a rulemaking process at ISBE to me that someone recognized that this is, you need to do this differently. It was nice that someone did the legwork for us. Uh, no doubt. Right. No doubt. So this Thank doesn't you. require any additional um, requirements of us procedurally or it doesn't cost us any more money? It doesn't cost us any more money procedurally, yes. Mm -hmm. We'll have to take action in January, uh, February 21. To sign the agreement. And there'll be a, a board proclamation and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it'll, it'll be an action item for our next meeting, which is why we've got it here today. But within the administration, mm -hmm. it doesn't change how? Oh, no, no. Okay. It doesn't change anything that we do. Any other questions? Okay, information regarding the DDMS expansion presentation is available for the board's review. Are there any questions? Are we going to go Great, let's jump in. <laughs> Are oh. we going to go through this? Yeah, okay. We're going to start with Jason and Heather <coughs> with a presentation for us in regards to middle school concept. And this is much for those of you sitting behind them as it is for those of us up here at, at the board level, just understanding what we do here in the building and the middle school concept. So that said, you're up. Now, whenever we talk about staffing, or you might want to talk in the microphone. Staffing or logistics, obviously at this level, grade six, seven, and eight at Dunlap Middle and Dunlap Valley, the one thing that drives our decision making is how does that fit within that middle school concept. Well, today we're talking about renovations and enrollment numbers and, and so forth. So that's why we're going to start with the idea of what, what is that middle school concept? What's it look like? Uh, what do our teachers do? How does it affect students? Uh, what are the best practices that are embedded within that middle school concept? And as you can see on the screen right now, uh, there's two things. It's twofold. One, the collaborative piece on uh, where teachers meet and how teachers meet each day in those, in those smaller teams and also making those smaller uh, teams within a, a larger school setting. Meaning, how do you take 450 students and make it look like 150 or 75? And that's, that's a big piece of that middle school concept. Uh, because of their age, uh, their, their social, emotional, uh, academic gaps, uh, things that they may be struggling with, we have safety nets in place in order to help with that. And we included some of them. Uh, one that is a, a huge piece of that collaborative piece is creating action plans for students that, that may struggle, whether it be uh, IEPs, 504s, uh, RTI students, uh, would be SEL components. Uh, our teachers do an excellent job uh, every day meeting on those students. It's one thing to meet on the students, but what are you going to do with the students? How do you help the students? How do you engage the student? What data are you looking at? Um, and there are things in place right now at both schools uh, that have that teaming component that is, is beneficial to students, a best practice for students. Uh, parent meetings, uh, I can speak directly to our sixth grade team. Uh, any student uh, in September and October who had an RTI plan, meaning they had gaps either in reading or math or both, we were able to meet with every single family. And you're talking 13, 14 families to walk them through uh, the deficiencies, look at the data. Uh, again, it's easy to analyze data, but how do you put a plan in place? Who's embedded? Uh, what interventions? What days a week? How can you help at home? How can we support you? How can you support us? Uh, that relationship building is a big component of that. Uh, counselor visits. Uh, every, every week, once a week, our counselors visit with those grade level teams. 
And, and one tidbit, you know, we always talk about programs and packages and curriculums. Uh, in this case, SEL, we're always looking at things like Best Web and Second Step, you know, all good things that we do in our buildings, but you can't replace the person. And I would say our biggest and most successful SEL component uh, for grades six, seven, and eight is the usage of the counselor. Uh, she can hear teachers' concerns. She can hear parent concerns. She can speak to students, hear their concerns, interview them, uh, do a force choice menu. All of those components come into play in regards to having that counselor embedded. So we always talk about what can we add, what can we implement, and, and many of them are very good. But that counseling component for a 11-year-old, a uh, 12-year-old, or a 13-year-old is, is second to none in regards to that counselor. And I'm just going to add one thing. In relationship to this, the addition to the Valley here would equalize what that teaming would look like at both of our middle schools. So not only would it be a benefit here to the students at Dunlap Valley, but it would be a huge benefit to Dunlap Middle as well. So that's an important piece to keep in mind as we go through this. Could you just quickly share with us too, um, I think in the past we took the concept away partially. Has it been fully, re where, it has not been right fully put back into place. So there are full teams here at Dunlap Valley Middle School. There are at Dunlap Middle School, there are two teams in sixth grade, and then there is one team at seventh and eighth grade. And so by adding this addition, it would equalize those numbers and we're gonna get into an example of that coming up later and then that would show where that would all fall out. And how many students does a team cover? Roughly 150. Okay. Uh, that would be your five sections, uh, okay. up to 150 kids, give or take. Um, at your five sections and nine period day. That will allow for a study hall, uh, your Panther Pride or SC, uh, SLC, and then obviously the five sections and so that covers all the students? Absolutely. Well, if you have grade. two teams, it goes up to 300, but that, that's not feasible right now at Dunlap Middle. Okay. Another component, sorry, is obviously the administration. Um, we have the opportunity to attend on a weekly basis, and what we do is discuss these, help schedule the meetings, uh, provide input, listen. Um, I learn more in those team meetings than I do in, in most places about the students, about the families, and what teachers see and what they think. Uh, the progress monitoring, obviously every two weeks, uh, we have the opportunity to look at STAR data, uh, look at uh, COGAT data, look at PARC data, uh, look at any type of data that we're looking at with, you know, Reading Plus or Read Naturally. What are intervention you're working on with those students? We can now see how it's benefiting or lack thereof for those students. And then I was the cross-curricular. I mean, authentic task, um, real-world scenarios, embedding ELA, uh, providing U.S. history components and science. Science Fair is a perfect example of how we can make those curriculums alive and real and authentic. And again, a big part of the component middle school concept is the exploratory. And we list those below for you to look at for your review as well. And that's a big problem right now at Dunlap Middle, uh, having the ability to have the exploratory based on lack of, of space in, in regards to where they can offer those classes. Uh, so everything I just spoke to does allow both buildings to um, benefit from these best practices that we're talking about now in regards to what renovations would allow in those two buildings. One inequality that you're going to see off the bat is extracurriculars. And, and this, is, this is pretty you know, eye-opening based on opportunity and, and, and how students can take advantage of those opportunities. For example, in girls basketball, Dunlap Middle cut nine students. We didn't cut any. Furthermore, we only had six students try out in eighth grade. So quality programs, confidence building, um, longevity, sustaining programs. It's difficult when you have six players, but yet you're cutting nine at Dunlap Middle. That's, again, offset and that's important. In softball, we had one student try out for softball in grades seven and eight. Now we made it work by co-opting with Dunlap Middle and that student with Dunlap Middle. But again, sustainability, quality programs, we struggle. Um, boys basketball, there was 26 cuts made at Dunlap Middle and only two at Dunlap Valley. And then volleyball at Dunlap Middle cut 39 and we cut three. And when you add them together, the difference is obviously eye-opening you know, 122 students at Dunlap Valley, or Dunlap Middle, uh, did not have the same opportunity. Where if there was inequality or balance in numbers, some of those students, they, there still may be a cut, they still may not have made it, 
but let's provide the opportunity. Let's see where it takes us. Let's see those opportunities where they exist. Uh, so again, 122 at Dunlap Middle and 20 at uh, Dunlap Valley for a difference of 102 students being cut at Dunlap Middle. And that wasn't the case five, six years ago. But due to the growth of Dunlap Middle and, and the, the boundaries five, six years ago, the growth cells are at Dunlap Middle and the enrollment's going up. That's why you're seeing a bigger number now than maybe you would have seen five, six years ago. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through the projections and I know you guys have seen these numbers before, but I wanna make sure that we had this spelled out. The difference that was made in this projection sheet is I took our current enrollment numbers and the cells that are highlighted in yellow up at the top, those are taking those current numbers and rolling them up. And then beyond that is where we use the projected numbers that have been projected by the projection firms. So I wanted to make sure and point that out to everybody. Um, so you can see next year with numbers rolling up, we are very tight at Dunlap Middle. In fact, they're really over capacity if those numbers hold true after registration. So current fifth graders at our feeder schools for Dunlap Middle, as new students come in, have been told that they will more than likely be attending here at Valley. Um, and we've been discussing that with them as they're coming in. Um, you can see where the seats fall out, but having 37 for next year as we discussed makes it very difficult to run a middle school schedule when you're looking at keeping class sizes at 30 or lower I mean in all of our class sizes are really pushing that 28 29 30 number there is not a lot of leeway in running those schedules so that makes for the difficulty when it comes to room when it comes to that capacity I don't know if you have anything to add on that Jason I just want to make sure you guys had the numbers and any questions on any of these here I think, too, in the discussion in December, it was reported that 27 or 28 students that should be at DMS are currently at DVMS this that, year. That's correct. We're about 28 students uh, that are the Dunlap Middle School boundaries that either in grade 6, 7, or 8 are attending Dunlap Valley right now as we speak. And they have to be bused. There, and, and Tony will probably speak to this better than I could, but we're talking 11, 12, 13 buses coming by picking up one or two students because of the routes. Right. Thank you. Right. And we'll, really it can go the other way too. We have certain grade levels that might be full and then those students then go up to DMS, even though that may not seem logical when it comes to staffing and the way things go, um, then they need to go up to DMS. I believe that was the case for a while at sixth and eighth grade, correct? Yeah, and to, to that point, Yes, we had students down here that should have been Dunlap Middle, but we've had students at Dunlap Middle that should have been up there, and they're just crossing each other. So it, there's this offset and balance from neighborhoods to communities where we're past each other in regards to trying to balance off, balance out grades six, seven, and eight based on our enrollment numbers and our staffing and our space. What are the enrollment numbers mid-year? Have they gone up? Since the beginning of the year, or where are they in relation to the beginning of the year? I can speak to Dunlap Valley. We're about 122 and 6, 141 and 7, and 126 and 8, meaning middle, 7th grade right now at Dunlap Valley, we can create two or three more schedules, and we're almost at capacity. In grades 6 and 8, we have a little bit of room, but they, they've held steady. I wouldn't say they've gone it's up. Been, it's been uh, yeah. stable since the we beginning. We lose of the one, year. gain one. I mean, it, okay. I, I think our six day enrollment numbers were. 121 and 6 mm -hmm. and 124 and 8 so they've helped one okay. or two okay so when we move on to the next slide in the presentation then we are taking a look at an example and there's a slide that shows visually so you can see where our current enrollments are you can go to the next one Oh, there we go. Where our current enrollments are over there on the left and where the percentages fall out. Um, and so we took an example. If we were to relocate 60 students to Dunlap Valley, and we use 60 for, for clear cut numbers just so that it would make sense, it would put enrollments pretty close together. It would be DMS would be 186 and Dunlap Valley would be 182. And that would create some equity when it comes to sections and when it comes to classes. Um, so if we go on to that next slide, um, what that does is it's the equivalent of adding two sections at each and then it decreases two at DMS. So that would be moving, it would have seven sections of every course, 
Um, currently, Valley is at five, and so that would equalize all of those sections at both of the buildings, at all three grades. Um, by moving those 60 students in each grade, it would require moving six teachers from Dunlap Middle down here to Dunlap Valley. Um, obviously, that's the simple math that goes along with it. On top of that, we would probably need to add somewhere in the range of one to three FTE teachers to accommodate the difference in Explore, PE, mainly. <coughs> That's going to be where the fluctuation is going to occur and where those class sizes are going to make a difference. You think if you're adding an additional gym down here at Dunlap Valley, you're creating more room in that schedule, but obviously to create those rooms in that schedule, you have to have the staffing to support that. So that's really where we felt that that staffing probably could do it with two, but I don't want to say that with 100% certainty because you don't know that that 60 number is exactly where the boundaries are going to fall either. I mean, that was good math for us to use here, but it may not be exactly 60 students. So classroom usage, this was the big thing when we talked back in December, you know, if we're adding three classrooms to each house, what would that, what would that look like? How would those be utilized? So if you're taking a look at eighth grade only, two classrooms would house that core content classes, those main ones, and then the two study halls would go along with that. That third classroom would be, and this is really the same at any grade level, somewhat of a rotating classroom. So it would be for Spanish or for French, explore, study hall. You wouldn't necessarily have one teacher in that room for the entirety of the day, but it would be utilized for the entirety of the day. Um, same thing for those additional classrooms at 6th and 7th grade, you'd have those 10 sections, your two study halls, and then you would rotate through. You could also rotate orchestra through there um, because currently orchestra meets out here, which at the end of the day is not ideal for them or for anyone walking through the area, so that would be able to provide um, a space for them where they would be able to have those courses. Um, the health courses could be in there, ESL could be in there, so all three of the houses uh, the classrooms in all three of the houses would be utilized. Anything else to add to that? Well done. Okay, any questions you guys have on that? Would class sizes go down at all or not really? It's hard to say. I'll let Jason speak to that a little bit. It, it could. Um, and again, if you go back to this slide here, what you're going to see is, is the, the, the separation. Right now, Dunlap Middle house is about 70% of our middle school students. So all sixth, seventh, eighth grade students of that whole number, 70% attend Dunlap Middle. It's more like 68, but I'll use 70 for easy math. 30 for Dunlap Valley. So it's not necessarily cutting back the class size. It's creating balance in our two buildings. And you may find situations, yes, where class size will go down. Um, but there'll be some that it, that it won't because you're still going seven sections, for example, at Dunlap Valley. So you had two sections of 60 kids, that's two sections that roll down. Again, that's not accommodating growth. That's balancing the two schools. So that's important that you understand that it's, it's not accommodating growth. That you start talking growth, it's, we can make it work about 240 with three classrooms per house, okay? That's using uh, the plan period of the first hour teacher, the plan period of the second hour teacher, the third hour team, there's five empty classrooms. So you would have a, a teacher bouncing from class to class. Very feasible, very doable. Most schools do it that way. We've been lucky we haven't had to, but that's something that we, you can go to 240 with that. that. That meets that demand of your growth. So three classrooms does a great job maintaining the middle school concept in both buildings, balances the schools in both buildings, and the opportunity to accommodate growth to 240 at some point. So it, it does allow that opportunity. One of, the, one of the concerns was would we have empty classrooms? Looking at an initial schedule at Dunlap Valley, there won't be empty classrooms. Um, mainly because if you add two sections, those 60 kids, that's two sections of Explore. That's two sections of, of PE. That's a section of, of Spanish if you add now because of, of the increase in enrollment. So there may be an hour or two where that class is not being used, but that won't be a common trend. I mean, classes will be used. I know that was a concern of the board, and I want to make sure I was able to articulate that in a way that, that, that made sense. 
And on the other hand, uh, do you think this will be enough of an expansion to not be crowded in five years? Randy? Well, it seems <laughs> like... <laughs> it That's seems, a great question. Well, and it seems just when we act, we're full. Like, you know, you built DVS. I, I can give you an example. For example, fast. right now, eight, seventh grade's at 141. Okay, and I just told you seven sections is about 210. If you take power lit, advanced math, based on those numbers, our capacity may be 197, 198. If we were looking at seventh grade numbers, and we didn't do this for, the, for a reason, but you look at seventh grade numbers at 141, add 60 kids here, you're at 201. Okay, so you're at capacity in, in seventh grade, or next year's eighth grade if we did that. But you can go to 40 by maximizing team periods, prep periods. That's where the extra staff comes into play, but you'd add anyway. Are you following me? So, no, I'm, you're not, I'm not following you. So you'd fill up the classrooms instead of having teams in there or other things, you would, or study halls, or not study halls. Yeah, for example, right now, there's a plan. Every teacher has a plan, so that classroom is not being used. Okay. We have five teachers, so at some point there's five empty classrooms. I got you. You know, I wonder too if we really should build for a little growth. We we seem to have like at uh, Hickory Grove. I think we built for growth, but it did not take long, and it was full, and it did not take long, and DVMS was full. We redistricted, and almost you know DMS was full. So it would seem well. Maybe like I said, wise. you can go two ten mm -hmm. and maintain current staffing and maintain the middle school concept uh, in, in a very uh, constructive way. Above that, you can go 240 using team periods, uh, prep periods, and the extra, you can go 240 and make that work too. The only difference is you're adding a staff member, which you would do anyway with additional growth. And you just move people around exactly. in classrooms. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of staff members, and I know we're always trying to you know, conserve costs, and Heather, I know you are busy, um, but I guess I wonder with the new man PE if you, if you took a look at that, if that may or may not cut down an FTE on PE, where we wouldn't have to maybe hire an additional. We could keep it as is, or the, that's the can, challenge with that, that would later. be. We can think about that. The challenge with that would be what would you do on those off days? I know. I know it wasn't scheduling kind of a, wise. What would you do with the kids on the off? It's days? a sticky mandate. I know. No, I agree. But then there's the other one though is is for sports, right? If you're in sports, you don't have to take PE. That's at the high school level. Oh, okay. It doesn't extend to the middle school. No. Okay. To to Heather's point, if they don't go to PE, they have to go somewhere. <laughs> so you're adding a staff member somewhere for some. What is that class? What is that You know, you've got to account for a nine period day, regardless of what class that is couple points on enrollment and expansion and future. Enrollment numbers are extremely challenging to estimate. And in the environment when your, your local industries are moving people out of town and et cetera, et cetera, well, what, but what might happen in a year to go the other way? It's just impossible to predict. So I, I value the enrollment estimates. It gives us a model, a possibility, but there's really no way to, to guarantee any of that. Our architects have done a good job of setting us up for what's next. Mm -hmm. If you saw on the plans, there were dotted lines on the plans at the <coughs> entrance to each house. There are two rooms as dotted lines for the next expansion, whatever that next expansion might be. Now that may not be what you'll end up needing at some point, but at least that's been planned for. The other point of this is uh, drawing new lines. Both of them mentioned that and went over that. That certainly has to occur. To me, the logical time for that is once we have fall enrollment and see the live bodies that are here in the fall, that's the time to get after the redistricting and re-enrollment plans for that following year. So that's certainly part of this. It's just not part of today. Uh, so those lines will have to occur. How many kids will we plan for to move down grade by grade. Well, there has to be more discussion for that as to what is that right number. And, and right now, frankly, we haven't worked on that. But that is certainly coming as time progresses.
Thank you very much. Thank Do you. We, we appreciate it. Maybe we should go over to the architects next and go through the plans. Antonio, can you flip over to the other one? We have with us today from uh, <coughs> me, from uh, Wold Architects, Matt Bickle and Dan Critta, and they are both here to talk with us about uh, the plans that you have seen in the hallways and what they have put together for this expansion. Matt, up to you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, board. Uh, we're excited to be here. Um, just a bit of background, I'm Matt Bickle with Wold Ruck Pate. Um, I'm a partner with the firm, an architect, uh, and I was the lead, uh, pro project lead on this project uh, when we worked with the district uh, to design this building uh, when it opened back in 2008. Um, I have with me Dan Crota as well, and he'll, uh, Dan, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I thought you were going to take care of that. Thought about it. Uh, I'm Dan Crota. I'm also with Wold Rock Pate. Um, educational uh, planner for the for the our corporate team and uh, I was a little bit on the sidelines for the last couple projects but I uh, was involved for a little bit from a distance so I'm very familiar with what happened down here and uh, I'm excited to help you move to the, to the next step. So as we worked with the district uh, when, when Dunlap Valley was being designed, uh, as you're aware, uh, the building was conceived for future expansion. Um, the, the idea was that it was a 450 student uh, middle school day one that had uh, core functions sized for possible expansion up to 900 students. Uh, and so with that, the cafeteria, the food service, uh, the gymnasium bleachers, things like that were discussed early on. Let's build those large enough to accommodate the, the future. Um, the other piece of that then was area around the building and within the building was, was thought of as to how would we grow. Um, we didn't want to uh, leave that to be something that the district had to figure out in the future. Uh, we wanted to make it part of the original master plan for the building. So uh, as you're aware, uh, and as you see on the, the plan on the screen, the areas in blue um, were areas where the existing classroom houses were planned for future expansion. So each classroom house, each grade level, uh, today has four classrooms and a science lab. Uh, the idea was that a, a mirrored uh, four classroom five and, and uh, fifth uh, teaching space science lab uh, would be created in the future. Um, as the board has discussed, uh, and as the idea has sort of grown, that uh, really uh, the need is for, at this time, three classrooms at each level. Um, we took about uh, thinking about how would that expansion differ if we were just building three classrooms versus uh, the, the five classrooms that were master planned. And came up with a concept that uh, achieves that by uh, not isolating that three classrooms uh, as a standalone addition, a separate house, but actually integrates it into con today's current house uh, so that that team environment that Jason and Heather were talking about can be continued uh, with the expansion. With the master plan also was uh, the thought of a future gymnasium, um, not only an additional teaching space, but a, a, another uh, court to take uh, pressure off of the after-school activities scheduling um, and this would be a, a, a gymnasium that would be sized for a full competition court uh, with side uh, with space allowed on the sidelines uh, for you know a small uh, two or three um, row bleacher system for some spectators one other thing that I want to point out on this plan then is as you look at expansion of the of the houses um, there's a area of the building in light blue. Oh, I guess it doesn't point. Um, that is uh, located between the eighth. Oh, thanks, Jason. Between the eighth grade house uh, and uh, the back of Spartan Theater here. Um, that's an opportunity that we've highlighted on this plan uh, for building a little bit of extra square footage uh, where we would enclose um, what would otherwise become um, you know, sort of an un. Uh, unfriendly space uh, where the geometry of the buildings come together there. That is a space where, uh, again, you would just be enclosing one, one wall of what other, what, what other eyes already have three sides. So it would be in, uh, in an economical space to build and, and could gain some additional storage space for the building. So as we, so this is that storage area as I, I was just discussing. So as we begin to look at this, um, what it does is if we look at the sixth grade house, uh, here is the entrance into the house, into the locker commons, and where you would come into the classroom areas now. 
Uh, originally, the idea was that you would continue to the end of the hallway and there would be a whole second uh, sixth grade house constructed. As I began to mention that if with three classrooms, you would be creating a scenario where you had a five classroom house and a three classroom house. So what we looked at is how could we create a situation where those three classrooms are connected within the, within the existing resource area so that the teachers uh, would have one shared area uh, where students uh, could work uh, independently or in small groups in that resource area. It would also allow for ex some expansion of the locker commons area. As Matt mentioned, uh, you can see the, the kind of continuous elbow with the locker bay area. Um, that also gives you some uh, advantageous sight lines. So you can still see the locker areas from one vantage point at the corner. Um, as you wrap around the corner, then you enter that house that, that really would be a, not its own entity. It would be a, a, cont a continuation of the house that's already there. Um, we also want to dash in an opportunity that the, the board may want to entertain, and this might be based on uh, bid day results, but with the three classrooms, they're all traditional classroom sizes currently, but that dash is exemplifying the footprint of another science lab. So you could build that science lab at this early stage if dollars are available. And uh, one of the suggestions we have is, as Matt talked about, that storage notch in the building is maybe you do this as an alternate, which just gives you the flexibility that if bids come in very favorable, you could opt to do this at one or all three houses uh, to actually build that more flexible space. And I think that would cater to some of the exploratory classrooms that uh, Jason was talking about. Uh, could be a backup orchestra space and have direct contact or connection to the locker area as well. So it gives a lot of more flexibility and on this next phase, you already have that, that built. A couple of small areas, uh, we were showing toilets and conference rooms. Those are some of the dialogue we're gonna have here as, as we move into design to make sure we're refining those programmatic needs so there'll be more definition. It's, it's what we assume to be right, but we'll still kind of uh, take that to the next level as we meet with the building stakeholders. Is there any questions on the plan so far before we move into that? I did yes. have a question. Um, based on your initial description, um, the DVMS was uh, designed so that the core facilities could take, go from 450 to serving up to 900 students you mentioned. And that would be the cafeteria and I think you said the gym? So yeah, the gymnasium bleachers. So the idea bleachers, is that right. the bleachers can hold 900 students. So if you have an all, all school assembly, everybody can do it. You don't have to do it in shifts. Right, okay, and, but then you mentioned something about the lab equipment. So um, currently as it's designed, there isn't a four additional labs, right? So you go from three classes per grade utilizing one lab space, I assume. Now that's got to be shared by six classrooms without an additional lab facility. It, right. Am I understanding that right? Yep, and that's the question that we that we asked recently when we met with, with Randy and with Jason is, would this additional 60 students at each grade level uh, trigger a need for an additional science lab? And the idea was that not at this time, um, based on this, this the conceived kind of scheduling. But that was okay. the idea that Dan was talking about is, that could be a, a bid day alternate where this classroom here could be sized large enough to be a, a science lab um, or, or a larger flex space for um, different programming. Is our science lab now the larger size? Okay. It, yes. Okay. That's the exact same footprint as your current lab. Okay. Thank you. So, so I see Jason back there. Is there a concern about the pressure on the lab or at this time it's, it's fine? The exact numbers. We're looking at seven sections possibly. Um, if the opportunity to expand that is there, um, you can still do a lot of things that are embedded in those labs. You can still buy furniture and science, furniture, the long tables, the, the, the heavy tables, the, uh, the storage area, the space, the, the closet. You, there's really not much difference other than running water. But again, the flexibility of our staff and our teachers can make that work. Okay. Um, that, Blueprints there where you can expand. I can see that being a science lab at least two to three out of day. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to the schedule, um, we feel this is a very manageable schedule, partly because this was uh, designed to expand 
it'll streamline that uh, construction minister construction document phase that we jump into so this assumes a February 21st authorization by the board to move ahead and uh, it puts us in about a three month design construction document stage so we get bid documents and you'll see the next layer down on that site steel and foundation package uh, to really get people contractors mobilized with those essential trades right away um, we are recommending that we do an early site package and all that means is that we would have those packages designed to bid a little earlier that could get contractors on site as early as June 1st so they kickstart that site and, and foundation work um, the, the next phase, the design or construction document uh, bidding for the rest of the trades would then t follow by about a month. So that puts, right now it's targeting your May board meeting for a site award and a, the June board meeting for the construction package award. Um, that puts the goal of June 1st, there's, there's activity on site with the construction trades and uh, that construction would work through about the end of June, early July of 2019. There's a break line in that graph there. There's some missing months and intentionally, but um, that would, looking at a move-in date of about July 25th then, so you can get furniture, uh, orientation, teachers, and things like that can happen in that month of July. We also have a detailed schedule that breaks down more of the activities in that timeline. Uh, just a few things to highlight, I won't go through all these, but uh, as soon as you authorize this project, we'd want to get our geotechnical evaluation or soil borings underway, as well as a topographic survey. Those are two things that we, it's background data we need to, to move forward. Um, we'd also start doing some bi-weekly or, or more often uh, program meetings with the stakeholders of the building here to make sure we're refining this new addition it's, so it's relevant to what's going on in the building now. Uh, the other uh, dates are, are represented on the on the overall calendar, but I think one thing that is important to see uh, towards the bottom here before it turns to the darker blue, that November, December 2018 timeline, that is a target that we, uh, this will all working backwards from that is we want to have enclosure of the building so we can make sure that uh, the weather's out and the trades can then start working in, on the inside of the building uh, while the winter, uh, sun, winter weather hits. So another milestone in that calendar. The last piece that we have for you is uh, we just wanted to provide a, a snapshot of where we think uh, today um, total total project budget uh, for this expansion uh, lies. Um, so as we talk about total project budget, we talk about first and foremost the construction costs um, and looking at nine classrooms um, or roughly 19,000 square feet of, of classroom space and a gymnasium addition which would be almost another 8,500 square feet um, and then uh, uh, also factoring in uh, a site allowance for the necessary redevelopment of the site and I meant I meant to s mention that when we were looking at the overall site plan um, the parking uh, and the bus loop are, are already sized adequately as well for uh, that that additional influx so there isn't really much uh, site work in terms of, of parking uh, and driveway uh, work the, the site utilities uh, likewise uh, were sort of put in place to allow for the expansion so it's really um, a matter of, of, of grading the site out um, for the building expansion areas um, and then in doing what's necessary to uh, address the stormwater, um, you know, rainwater situation that is created with building more buildings on the site. Um, so all that in, uh, said, um, you know, we've tested these numbers uh, with recent projects that have bid. Mm -hmm. We've also talked to the construction industry to see where they think uh, pricing is currently. Uh, and we feel very confident uh, that uh, construction cost-wise, uh, this should be somewhere around uh, $6.4 million. Uh, then we also factor in the project costs, uh, the design fees, uh, the soft costs for uh, testing and permitting those uh, geotechnical and site survey uh, components that Dan mentioned, uh, as well as uh, the furniture necessary for outfitting the additional classrooms, uh, additional uh, computers, that types of things. So, uh, we factor in uh, those, those, those estimated uh, project costs as well um, at another $1.4 million uh, for a total estimated project cost of about $7.9 million. So i got a quick question, maybe Jason or Tom. So your air handler issues here, are they something that you could take? Do you have ongoing problems with them, or do we want to look at fixing that, or will that be part of this, or is it fixed? I guess it's been an ongoing issue, right? At this time, it's been fixed, and the architects have been tasked to 
assure me that our system is more than adequate to handle the expansion. And what is the average cost now nationwide? I was looking at a study back in 2014. Average cost for middle school was was uh, 173.4 square feet per student. You know, I know that's an older report, but what? And and that might be for the whole school being built, not a, not an addition. But are our costs a little higher because our materials are so nice in this building, or 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 are we at the you know are we closer to the average cost? Is that a 173 per? Is it per square, square foot? Square foot per student. Okay, that that's. I think that's a square foot allowance per student and the overall building. Oh, um, okay. Area. It's a different different yeah. measure. Okay. Although that probably isn't that far off from 2014 numbers. I'm sorry, they're square foot. It's 242. 242 dollars per square foot. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking at square foot per student. So yeah. sorry about that. From a national basis, I would say if that was average nationally. In 2014, Illinois would be a little bit below that, especially in the outstate areas. In so area. we're tracking in that same. It's vein. about average. Yeah. And so, do we have higher um, finishes and materials? I mean, this school looks so great. Is it? Well, again, I think that goes to the forethought that was put into the planning of the building for this expansion. Um, where you see a lot of the, the, the higher end finishes are in these core spaces of the building um, that are already sized where they need to be. When you go into the classrooms, um, you know, you're, you're, it's carpet and painted concrete blocks. So okay. um, I don't think there's anything, Not on that no edge. frills really. Okay, okay. Thank you. Other questions of our architects? How often, oh, go ahead. I have one, one quick comment, and I know you said that you're going to be meeting with stakeholders, but um, from past experience, we've had expansions in another lifetime with myself, but, and it seemed that uh, teachers were not necessarily talked to or consulted, and then when they move in, there's not a plug-in for the computer and a plug-in for the printer, and so I, I'm sure you will, but I think that's really important for the stakeholders, especially the teachers that will be using the, the rooms, to be able to be part of that, uh, at least with the plug-in issue and, and the, where the smart boards or whatever you're going to be using, because they're the ones that have to live with it, so it makes it practical. And we, we couldn't agree more. We think that's an, an important piece of the, the process. Thank you. I know this is a frill, but how many schools have uh, air conditioning in their gym? <laughs> Anything built maybe after 2015? Uh, it's really, okay. it, it's it's pretty much, uh, um, I would say it's a little bit of a, a luxury from the standpoint of how many districts are actually going down that path. Okay. Um, it, you know, there's a, probably a date or a threshold of, of schools that were built maybe pre-2000 that you won't, you'll be tough to find a gym with a air conditioning. Um, it's a hard question to answer. Right. Okay. And how much does it add to the cost? Do you know? Thoughts on that? Probably big on ongoing utility. Yeah, I guess you, you, utilities are more. You'll certainly have an until, a utility impact. We have to bring in ventilation per code uh, to do the air conditioning. There's a, a, a utility up. Was it built for air conditioning? Yes. Oh, it was. So we already have that. It would just be adding the unit and the ongoing usage? This might be a different number, but Tom, do you remember, I think there was just a little look into putting air conditioning at the high school in the gym, but it was a significant cost. Do you recall, were you here? It may have been, it would have been like a year ago, maybe at the beginning of this year or last year, there was a number thrown out, but that's okay. It, it really doesn't matter. I just thought off, if you knew off the top of your head. Thank you. Anything else for them? Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a safe trip back. Have yeah, safe travels. Thank you. Antonio, could you switch back over to the <laughs> other one? Next part of our presentation is Jack Bambrick who is our director of finance is going to go through some of our uh, the financial numbers here and for the board members that was in your packet underneath the 
middle school section. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, and Could you please speak into the microphone just so the audience can... There we go. Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I couldn't tell. <laughs> All right, um, you know, some of the things that come, come to mind, first of all, you know, when we talk about increased staffing is, okay, you know, can we sustain those kinds of costs? And so I just thought I would start off there first. And when we take a look at, uh, at our current year budget, and when we take a look at the, you know, revised revenues and expenditures, right now we're looking at potentially at, uh, at about a $500,000 uh, surplus uh, at the end of this uh, fiscal year. So that being said, I mean, that speaks well to everybody's fiscal responsibility to, uh, to, to making sure that we spend funds wisely. But how does that, I mean, that's just one year. How does that play out over time? And, and so when we take a look at over time, then we begin to look at, at our levy and the levy process. And you take a look at what uh, the certified levy was for uh, that was filed in December, at the end of December. And, and that certified levy was uh, to, to capture approximately $1.2, $1.3 million. And when you take a look at the cost of, of adding the additional staff and, uh, and then adding into the, the rolling over of uh, our current staff, I mean, we're, we're well within our costs uh, to be able to sustain that. So that's the good news, okay? That, that is very good news. And... Um, so what I thought I would do then next would be go go on to okay how do we how do we pay for all this and and over the years you've uh, you've heard a lot about the school facility sales tax there's been a lot of uh, discussion and, uh, and and the like and and very fortunate that, that you have that as uh, as a backup for bonding capacity. So when we take a look at, uh, we've worked with uh, Mesero Financial, who you've worked with in the past, uh, for bonding. And when we take a look at uh, the general obligation um, alternate revenue bonds, or the typical bonds that are utilized uh, to, for the, uh, the sales tax proceeds. And um, when, when you take a look at $8.3 .3 million was a number that was typically thrown, thrown around. Uh, you have approximately 1.2 million in, uh, you know, estimated that, that you are going to be bringing in monthly in terms of uh, sales tax uh, revenue. And uh, of that, you, you have to have a debt service coverage, so of, 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 and that's a factor of about 1.25. So you have about $960,000 monthly is the present value is how they figure that to be able to cover the debt service piece. So for 8.3 million uh, over 10 years, you know, discounted could be looking at about 2.65 percent. Um, and if can we go back to that uh, previous slide, I can here. Back one. There, oh, too fast. There we go. Okay, so um, not the first yellow column. The second yellow column shows exactly what your you know what your pay down looks like. Okay. Um, According to Mesereau, you, you could borrow more uh, and extend out over you know, 15 years. And so he's giving you some examples of what that might look like. All right, but if we're talking strictly this project in particular, um, the 8.3 million over 10 years would definitely cover, cover that. Okay, then the next step in that process then would be, um, as has been discussed, you know, talked about, you know, February 21st, the meeting, uh, and, and potentially where we go from there, you know, uh, in terms of moving forward. And, and so if everything goes well and is adopted at the February 21st meeting, then you have your timeline uh, for your bonding process. And it's pretty, you, you've been through it, uh, most of you have been through it before, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and if we were looking at, I asked them to put together a, a timeline uh, with a, a March 21st date so that we could look at, you know, the board adopting potentially the resolution then uh, uh, to issue bonds. And then the board president at that point calls for the buying a hearing. You know, buying a hearing is the bond issue, meets our requirements for the Bond Issue Notification Act. So it, it puts it out there in front of the public. It puts it out there for everybody. Um, and you go right through the uh, uh, the chart there. You have a 30-day notice, uh, 
and you know, there's a petitioning period, uh, the, and where that's also a part of when the Bina hearing is published. Uh, the Bina hearing could be held on the April 18th meeting at the regular meeting, and um, and then from the school district side, uh, the, the board then uh, on the week of May, let's see, excuse me, okay, yeah, the week of uh, May 7th. Um, adopts parameters and resolution authorizing issuance of the bonds. So then, essentially, you could be looking at that first week of June and the bonds would, you know, would hit the bank at that point in time. And so it would tie, dovetail in nicely with, with the whole process uh, that the architects have, uh, have laid out as well. I think it fits in very well. Are there any questions? I forgot to ask the question of the other of somebody else. I don't know if it's you, but the mobile units that we have at DMS would would we be able to get rid of those, or would we still be using those? To be determined. Okay. Right. A short term, of course, no. For the next year, they would still be in use. After that, that becomes another discussion point. Okay. So, Jack, you're proposing to go the ten years. Yes. And so are we projected to get about 1.2 million in sales, sales tax going forward annually? Is that what you're projecting yes. that to yes. the county? Yes. And they're not projecting and that to decrease because of internet sales? Not that we have heard at this point yet, no. And, okay. and you know, I think once, you know, we're just in our first year of, of proceeds, and you're going to see, you're going to see your seasonal highs and lows, you know, the start of school, uh, your holidays, that kind of stuff. And, you know, once you get your first full year under your belt, I think then you're going to be able to really determine where you're going to be going from there. Um, you know, and as I take a look, you know, e even as I talked about uh, uh, assessed value, I've talked with the county about assessed value, and, and currently they're, they're still saying that things are holding, you know, fairly well for this year, fairly strong. And even a couple years out, they're still saying, you know, they're still cautioning, you know, keep an eye on your EAV, but they're not seeing any, any big hits on that radar, even as far as two years out when I talked with them. Hmm. When you think about the sales tax, I wonder if most of our revenue comes from tournaments, conventions, you know. All of the above. Yeah, and so, you know, they don't, they don't come here and go to the computer to shop online. They hit the mall, you know. Right. So hopefully, hopefully that's what it is. And Absolutely. Part of the reasoning for why you can only bond for a portion is is that fluctuation. You know, they won't allow you to bond, bond for the entire 1.2 million that it shows oh, okay. in the chart. You can only bond for up to 960,000 of that just because of that potential fluctuation. So, so if you're only bonding for that, do we keep the rest for other maintenance projects or is if we have extra left over or what? What is that used for? <laughs> there's, there's always a use. Right, but I mean, it doesn't you go can. back into no, this? No, it does not no. go okay. back. No, okay. it does no. not. And, okay. and with the numbers we've had here today, if we had, say, $300,000 left over, that stays in Fund 60, which is a capital projects fund, and can be used for any kind of building project. That's county school facilities tax. You've all seen those charts. It has a very limited use. It's building kind of work. So that money would be there and available for you for whatever other building things need to occur. You might notice a difference in the numbers here too. There'll be about 200,000 each month that will come in to Fund 60 that will be part of the district revenue that you'll be able to use for those other kinds of building projects. So this doesn't exhaust all of the county school facilities tax money. Some of it will still be sitting in hand and available for you to use for other work the district needs to use. Can help with those emergency situations that may arise. Like flooding. Like flooding. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I just was, was looking. I know you were recommending the 10 year at the 2.65%, but was there any thought? Uh, you know, we have some other big things, uh, you know, i.e., a pool <coughs> that we were looking at. I mean, would this be the time to be having that discussion if you're going to look at the 20 year 3.75 and you'd be able to accomplish both of those things? Well, I think the thing, the, the nice thing about this is that you can always go back to redo, to do that, okay? So you can, it allows you to, you know, stay, keep your focus on your projects that you're, you're making as your priorities at particular points in time. So say, say you want to try and, and, and pick up some more later on. You can do that. 
Thank you. So you would recommend would not recommend taking on the pool and the middle school at this particular time? I, I don't think so, no. Okay. Any further discussion and clarifications? Do we dare move forward? That that is basically the end of our presentation on the middle school tonight. We've had our architects speak, our educational experts speak, you know, our, our finance guys speak, and we want to open up to the board here for any other anything that we missed at this point that anyone wants to ask. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jack, just sat down, but you know, <laughs> but this is financial. Um, you know, I know um, this is your first time presenting pretty much to us since you've been here and come aboard. Yeah. I wanted you to just give us a health check. Um, since you've come in, you've had the opportunity to take a look at everything and, and look at the health of this district as you came into it. Can you please just give us a brief update on the, um, the status and the health of our district financially? Well, I think, you know, the status, the health of the district financially kind of goes with that, with that brief summary that I, I gave to you early at the beginning. You know, oftentimes in, in budgeting and in school budgeting, we talk about the Ed Fund or we talk about the O&M Fund. You know, we have all these funds that we talk about, but really we, we focus on four main funds, our four main operating funds. That would be those being education, O&M, transportation, and working cash, okay? And when you take a look at, um, at those four funds and with, okay, at a snapshot in time, where we feel we are presently, of those four funds, you look at a potential budget surplus of one point, uh, of just about a million dollars. So I think that's extremely healthy. And, and there are many, many districts that would love to be in that kind of position. So does that answer your question it does i just wanted to make sure that you know that sure. we all hear sure. that um that there are a lot of great things that have been happening for some time in order for us to get to that point absolutely it doesn't happen overnight that's right no question thank you and i'm sorry what was that surplus number one uh, point uh, of the four of the four funds combined right around a million dollars it's, it's a million eighty two thousand that's great and is that uh, where we are right now or where we're projected to be at the end of the year? That would be a projected for the end of the year. Great. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Anyone else? Stay put. <laughs> Stay put. Okay. Uh, you ready to come out your Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so information regarding the construction manager for DVMS is available for the board's review. Uh, I know there's going to be discussion about that. You're asking for guidance on the process for choosing the construction manager position. And I was curious, I don't know, Tom, I don't know if you were here, but um, what have we done in the past? Uh, what has been the past practice for selecting a construction manager? I know for the last several projects, Partnership with the company that was agreed upon. So, how was he selected? How was so? How was the construction manager selected? Was there a bid process? Um, was for those projects that I'm aware of, no. No. There, were, there was no process like that. You you selected the project. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that was just chosen by the administration. Correct. Okay. I provided for you some options in your uh, board packet of how we could go about this. Um, one option would be to simply continue work with Mangieri as has been done in the past. Another option would be to, um, and I would just take these in the order that I, I sent them to you. So let me find that. Another option would be to use a board interview process. As and, and I'm sure Matt and Dan have been through this before is you hire a new architect, you are required as a board to interview architects and select an architectural firm. You could use that same type of process with a construction manager. Uh, it's not required, but it is the required process if you're hiring an architect. So that, that would be one option. The downside of that option is when you go through a board interview, you select a firm to work with, and then you negotiate price after the fact, which seems backwards, but that's the way the process speaks to for architects. 
And if we were to use that process for a construction manager, it, it, it should probably speak in that same way. Public bid is another option. Uh, the bidding law in the school code is very specific. When we go out to public bid for anything, we're required as a school district to take the lowest responsible bid. We're required to take the lowest responsible bid. There's no board decision making at that point. When prices come in for $10, $20, and $30, we're taking 10 because that's the lowest bid. That takes away any board review of different companies and requires you to lock in the lowest responsible bid. A phrase I used with Tom when I talked about this is, well, what if we get a bid from some firm out of Los Angeles? What are we going to do with that? And that's unlikely. But it takes away any board review of the different factors that could be a factor. A third option would be to go out to a request for a proposal. It could be very similar to the bidding process, but it would be something where we could go out and seek bids from either selected groups or open it up to public uh, to submit bids. Excuse me, use the wrong word, to submit requests for a proposal. And in that, the board would then have the opportunity to look at the different requests for proposal, look at the kind of work different companies have done, look at the pricing that they would submit, and make a conscientious, honest, well thought out decision as to uh, what construction manager group might be best to serve the district for a project like this. Um, I asked Tom to, Tom, I don't know any of the players here, give me, give me some names of some companies. Tom gave me a few names of some companies and I just listed those for your review. I, I frankly have heard of a couple of them and don't know anything about others. Uh, but part of the review of that process would be, send us your last 10 projects. Send us your last five projects you did over $10 million. How many schools have you worked at? Those types of activities would be, <coughs> excuse me, would be the kinds of things we'd be looking for. Timeline, uh, if we chose to go out to one of these options, what we would like to do would be to have someone in hand, hired, and ready to roll by the March board meeting. Uh, this is, again, an information item for you tonight. Don't need a decision tonight. We can have as much discussion as you want to have on it. But we, we would really like to have, a, well, we need a decision for February 21 as to what direction you all would like us to go. And then once we get that direction, we can go out and make that happen and bring that back for you for March 21. So that, that's kind of sum and substance of what I've presented to you, and I'm open to anything else, other ideas or thoughts that any of you might have, or just general discussion. Is there a required number of companies that we need to send the RIP to, or is that just on what, what we decide as a board? You, just, you decide that as a board, you don't have to send it to anyone. You could choose to just engage with one company, you could choose to open it up, you could choose to ask three, four, five. Okay. That is 100% at your discretion. And do you know the turnaround time? Like once you send the letter out, the request for proposal, what is the turnaround time that, generally speaking, they get back to you? Matt? Uh, I would say the first you would be able to be the okay. We had a conversation with Matt tonight about having a pre-construction meeting, which is, it's not pre, it's labeled something different, but it would be the same kind of thing, where we would go out and advertise or send invitations have a meeting with Matt and Dan here with any construction managers that would be interested. It would be a mandatory meeting, because if they don't want to come to that, they don't need to work for us. But it would be a mandatory meeting. And then that would give them an opportunity to put together a proposal and submit something. The presentation that they worked off of to hear is, is the presentation. That is the information that they would need to work from. What is the typical practice uh, right now for selecting a construction manager? Do you have a sense of that with other projects that you've worked on? I would say the third option that Randy has laid out is what we would see most typically. I did consult with Jay Greening, and Jay sent me a, an RFP process, a document, that we can fill in numbers and names and send off. So he has sent me a document. He's recommending that he thinks that's the best proposal. 
he would recommend that we definitely stay away from the bid process because you get you're locked in. Yeah, I agree. I think you're too limited. If we're going to go out for for bid on a professional service, which I know is not required to do for a professional service. I think the third option gives you more flexibility. It still lets you be accountable and hopefully seek not only the, the lowest bid, but the lowest quality bid. Right. So. I, I agree with that, Abby. Mm -hmm. yeah, is, is there anybody that Three. has, any, I mean, can we eliminate one and two? Does everybody agree on that? Yeah, I'm fine with number three because I think it does meet the need of transparency um, with the public and uh, due diligence without um, causing problems with our timeline. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that you say that that is quite common, that approach, um, because I'm aware that school districts do do that. I'm not sure in the past, um, I, I, I recall uh, on some bidding that uh, our former business manager did do just that, the number three option, and then would you know indicate what the recommendation is. In this situation too, I would, also bring up the with the number three option the way um, it you explained it to us by email it would be where the board would be involved um, in opening the bids and selecting um, I'm wondering if typically if you go with the number three um, if that isn't something that the business manager does maybe with the operations manager looks at all the bids if you have 20 bids coming in narrows it down and gives us our options but then makes a recommendation to us because I agree that's we'll, the background we'll, because we'll, here yeah. the we'll way it was described okay yep. that would be very oh, nice. yeah. Yep. yeah okay we'll, we'll make we'll make we'll we'll have the bid opening we'll make a recommendation okay and no, just no question just to clarify what you had said so she has done the um, request for proposal but that was like insurance related not we haven't done it for a the uh, manager I think we've just used managerial in the past I've, I've, yeah and I've got a Jay Greening document for that so we'll we'll be good with that and will one of the questions be uh, how many other projects are you potentially working on at the same time I mean I guess I just, uh, I just I'm just wondering <laughs> you know timeline uh, issues yeah yeah typically the, these companies will have other people that can work on site as the project manager they'll have more than one person okay uh, but you just assuring that you know you're right. going to get a dedicated person right and you can sometimes factor in penalties on timelines not being met correct mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I mean I would, there's a lot of things that you can ask for in our Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with number three, the request for sealed proposals from selected groups, but I guess I'm a little bit concerned with um, who the selected groups are, right? Um, I think, you know, if we always do what we've always done, then it'll always be the same, you know, handful of people that are given that opportunity or exposure to the business, right? So there may be other companies out there that uh, we don't know, so they're not given the opportunity to bid, you know, or put in a proposal for this business, that part does concern me. And so I, I know you don't want to do the bid, and I, I can agree with that. I understand the reasoning behind that. But, it, you know, I think it, this somewhat limits us 
as far as, you know, it's hand-picked who's even invited to offer. So I think that perhaps if there's a way that we can open that up, uh, I think we all received an email today, too, that showed that there was some other interests out there, and I think there's other companies who just um, perhaps just have never been given the opportunity or exposure. So I, I do have concerns about that. And so if we can find a way to ensure that that process is open somewhat to those who may be interested without going to a formal bid. That, that, that's easy to do. You know, the bidding process requires you to put, place notice in the paper, public bid opening, et cetera, et cetera. You could take something like that and modify it very easily and put in a request for proposal and have the same exact process. It costs an ad in the paper, $1,000 or whatever that would be. But it costs an ad in the paper to have that happen. You only have to, for the bidding process, you only have to put it in one time. And for this, it would be the same thing. Uh, we would probably reach out to companies of which we're aware and that wouldn't preclude anyone else, but we want to make sure that anyone that would be interested that we're aware of would at least know that the process is out there. So what I'm saying is we have several companies listed here. We'd probably want to let them know that this is happening, but at the same time, put an ad in, in the Journal Star, and that way it covers everyone. All right. Yeah, as long as it's open and transparent public process. There's also a state newspaper that, yeah, we'd be better served doing it here. That's a bad idea. There's a state newspaper that you can publicly bid. It's the Taylorville Breeze Courier, but this would be better to put it here in our local newspaper. Yeah, and you're right up here as the five, and you do make mention you can add others. You can certainly add others, yeah. right? And I would expect, I would expect all five of those to submit a proposal. I would expect uh, the company to email you today to submit a proposal, and then it's a, a question of looking at what projects have they done. You know, the question of who, how are they going to staff it. You know, can they handle a project of this size? Uh, you know, those those kind of factors are things that we'll all be looking at and 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 relying. I'm I'm sure on Matt and Dan to help us with too. Okay, are there any other questions? Comments? So should I bring this back then for February 21 for a formal vote to go through this process? Yes. yes. Yeah, Great. Yeah. We'll do so. Yeah. It, I, did you also did you also ask if we needed to take a vote on this? Because if we have consensus, is a, is a vote necessary on this piece of it? Well, I don't think it's really necessary. But I thought you said that in your email, so I. Just I, I may check. have. I may have. And if you gave me consensus and just gave us a direction of how to proceed, mm -hmm. we'll just proceed. I proceed. Think it, just, proceed. it just cuts two weeks off the time and lets yeah. us get going. I, th I think we should proceed. Everybody, everybody in agreement? Yeah. I don't think there was any opposition. That's Perfect. Why I raised Great that. idea. We'll sure. Okay. You need anything else from us? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, that will conclude then the information discussion item segment of the meeting, and we will move to closed session. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn to closed session. I move to adjourn to closed session for the following purposes as stated in the Open Meetings Act. Collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives. Um, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body. Second. It's been moved by Beth Reese, seconded by Don Bozeman. Is there discussion? Roll call vote, please. Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, motion carries. We are adjourned to closed session. Thank you all for attending. Okay. Uh, I'll ask for a uh, motion to approve the Human Resources Consent Agenda, agenda for 2017-18 as presented. I move to approve the Human Resource Agenda for 2017. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Abby Humbles and seconded by Beth Reed. Uh, is there discussion? Roll call vote, please. Do we? Did you have discussion? Are we going to add anything to that? Uh, yes. Yes. Can, can we add that to this? Oh, absolutely. Thing? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Okay, do you want to redo that motion, Abby? With the addition of the correction for the job. Uh, what's it called? Description. To see if That's we can right. change the job description to a an exempt position. To change right. the job description to an exempt position. Here we go. That works. Thank you. 
And it, what about, though, uh, stipulating that <coughs> if we can't, we will still move ahead? Subject to the law. Right. Yeah, Fair Labor yeah. Standards Act. Okay. Right. Okay. That if Is we can't, second? we will still second. move ahead subject to the law. Okay. It's been moved by Abby Humble, seconded by Beth Three. Is there a discussion? Roll call vote, please. Abstain. Aye. 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 Okay, uh, motion carries. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. I beat Cheryl. It's been moved by Beth Ree and seconded by which one of you? Teresa, Teresa. Holzhauser. Is there a discussion? Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned.